Now we come to the third speaker uh, for this afternoon. Uh, Professor Grantham has been serving in the Prince of Wales Hospital as an accident and emergency specialist and uh, has been also active in the European journals as uh, editors. And uh, one thing that uh, do uh, 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 makes me with, with the impression of Professor Grantham is his Chen uh, and Big Smile. So uh, <laughs> today uh, we have uh, been discussing about the patient and, and, and relatives. Now we are going to go to the area of the colleagues. It's about deceptions amongst healthcare workers. So, Professor Grantham. Thank you, Leo. Good afternoon, everyone. Come on. I need to know you're still alive. <laughs> I'm an emergency doctor. I've got to make sure you're still alive. Um, thank you, Leo. Thank you, Brian. And thank you very much to Shekhar and Professor Lee for the invitation to come along. I put this at the front of every talk that I do. The European Journal has me as their editor. They give me money. It's, it's definitely not deception to tell you that they don't pay me enough. I can promise you that for the amount of work that it takes. But there you go. So um, there's been some great talks today. And Clearly, the last speaker always has a challenge because you don't want to duplicate everything you've heard before. So I've got to find something new to take you through. So this is what I'm going to run through. And I work in the emergency department. I've worked in emergency medicine for more than 20 years now. And I would argue that as an emergency doctor, I'm probably the most lied to person in the hospital. <laughs> Everyone lies to me. The patients, the radiographers, the radiologists, my <laughs> colleagues, the relatives, you name it, they'll lie to me. But having said that, you'll see that we're not immune to lying ourselves. Now, I, I thought it would be quite useful just to go back. You know, I was thinking, when, when Shekhar asked me about this, I thought, my God, how am I going to do this? You know, I've never done anything on lying and deception before. So I thought, I'll go back and see what the definitions are. Seems a reasonable place to start. So lying, you know, we all know what lying is, the telling of truths. Of untruths, I should say. Um, <laughs> telling or containing lies and being deliberately untruthful. So, you know, that's fair enough. That's fairly absolute in terms of uh, truthfulness and untruthfulness. Then I thought, what's deception? Because deception's maybe not quite so black and white. So, deception is the art of deceiving, the state of being deceived. Well, that's not very helpful. Something that deceives it is, well, okay, still we're not very good. Fraud, well, okay, fraud maybe has a financial element to it. We, most of us can understand the word fraud. And then we had this word at the end, artifice. Now, you know, you might not believe it coming from Scotland, but I am a native English speaker, and this was, I think, probably the first time I've ever seen the word artifice. It's, it, you know, obviously it leads to artificial, but... I thought, what's well, artifice? So I thought, let's see what artifice is. <laughs> and this really got me thinking. Artifice is a clever trick or a stratagem, a strategy. Cunning, crafty device or expedient. While trickery, guile and craftiness, cunning, ingenuity and inventiveness. Now, many of us in healthcare would say we don't lie. We never deceive our colleagues. But you read through that definition, and I would argue that you do all of those. <laughs> and you do them every day, or certainly every week. And that made me think a lot about, you know, on what side of the line are we when we're doing all of these things? And that's really what I want to explore. I thought this was really good. Deception among healthcare workers is utterly rampant, but it's not reported. You're never going to sit down and, you know, how many times did you lie to your colleagues this week? Zero. You know, if you've written zero, then by definition you fulfill the criteria because you've just <laughs> lied. Um, but I think we come up with multiple justifications. Um, and I, I'm going to run through these now. This is talking in a more general sense, not just the emergency sense. Most of us at our core want to look after our patients. Most of us want to give our patients the best deal. I apologize in advance if there's any radiologists in the room. My sister's a radiologist, so I feel I can do these things. You know, I have a family reason to do it. 
But how many times have I, in good faith, said to a radiologist, he's a bit weak down the left side. He's not weak at all. But, you know, he's a bit weak. I think he needs a scan now. Are you sure he's weak? Yes, 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 I'm sure. Because I think he needs a scan now. Otherwise, the patient will wait for 10 hours to have their CT scan. Am I doing that? I'm definitely deceiving, no doubt. But am I deceiving for the patient's good or for my good? Probably a bit of both, but mostly for the patient. Everyone does that at some point or another to try and get things done. I would argue, though, and I say this, as I say, on the basis of family experience, the radiologist will also say the same back to you. No, we can't fit in another ultrasound today. And 10 minutes later, you see the radiologist having their lunch and enjoying a long coffee. Now, I'm not blaming them for that. We're all human, we need coffee. But it goes both ways. We've all done this to protect ourselves, both in written form and in spoken form. Your patient comes in, and in good faith you've examined them, or maybe not examined them quite as much as you would like to. We all have to cut corners at times because we're under pressure, and I'll come to that in a second. And we will write in the notes, after the patient deteriorates, no abnormality found. No abnormality detected. Something I learned from my legal friends long, long ago in Scotland was if you write NED in the notes, we think it means no abnormality detected. The lawyers believe it says not actually done. <laughs> and I think it's true. So we do things to protect ourselves, sometimes in panic because things have gone wrong, sometimes again in good faith. Then we go on the phone to Bernard and say, help. <laughs> Having said that, I think one of the commonest things I see in my setting, and we'll talk about this more now, is when I want to help my own team. We work in a rationed environment, most of us, particularly in public health care, although I would argue private health care is just as rationed, but maybe for slightly different reasons. And, you know, I've certainly, as a consultant, said to my seniors, you know, no, we, we're not safe tonight. We can't do this. We've only got two doctors on duty because someone's off sick. Now, you know, in, in essence, you don't. You can always pull someone in somehow, somewhere. But you will push that to give your team a break, to give your team some resources when the pressure makes life marginal for you. Again, is that bad? I don't know. Medical records, I think, are notorious. And again, I, I defer to our legal colleagues on this, but you know, we see this all the time. People will score out entries in the notes and they'll replace them with no counter signature, no note of why they've done it, no note of the time. I'm an emergency physician, so I measure time in minutes. If you're a general physician working in the clinic, you measure time in weeks and months, very reasonably. In my specialty and in intensive care and acute medicine, you have to time your entries so you can make them sequential, so you know who wrote what and when. We often don't do that. I certainly make a point when I've done a major resuscitation to write my first line is notes written in retrospect. And it comes back a bit to Bernard's comment earlier about expert witnesses. Many of our expert witnesses will go through a case with full knowledge of the final outcome. In my discipline and in all acute disciplines, you don't have that luxury when you start. You're working forward. And we need to bear this in mind clearly when we're writing, but also when we're doing our reports. I've noticed in radiology in particular, and again, this is not unique to my center and is not unique to Hong Kong. This is international. We have reports that are updated. Now, updated means we got it wrong first time, and now someone's told us there's a fracture, and now we're changing it to see what really is there. But more often than not, I've noticed that we actually just remove the original report. There's no note that there was ever a report in the system before that says there was no fracture. 
Now, I would argue that is downright fraud. That's not a reflection of what was found. Does it make the radiologist feel better? I'm sure it does. I can't speak for them. But that, to me, is just not right. Notes change without a signature. I think we have to do that. If you're going to change something, OK, but say why and rewrite your note in the future. I think we also see this in medical research. Our ICHGCP rules, good clinical practice rules across the, the pharma industry in particular, have tightened up on this a lot. And any of you, I'm sure many of you in the audience, are involved in clinical research. And the standard of documentation for those trials is much higher than it is for routine clinical practice. If it's good enough for the drug industry, why shouldn't it be good enough for what we do day to day? I'm an emergency doc. This is one of my favorite slides. If you're a medical student and you're off your head, you've got no attention span, come and see me. I'd be delighted to look after you. Notice we're very close uh, genotypically to the psychiatrist, although most people would argue with that. And I particularly like pointing out to my sister that she's afraid of the light and not so much on the hard work front. So um, this is quite a good indication of how much attention we have as emergency doctors and how much time we have to spend with our patients. This is my department. This is what you can expect if you pitch up to my place any time in the winter months. And I define winter as kind of October to April. That's certainly how it's defined in Scotland, but in terms of Hong Kong, in terms of how busy we are, this is what we face. Now, those of you who know Prince of Wales, come and see me. I'll take you around here any day of the week and you can see what happens, if we can find a space to walk. But this is not the waiting room, I'd hasten to add. These are the patients waiting to go to beds upstairs. This is in addition to all the patients who come in every day. And you'll notice there is no space between the beds, none. This is what we laughingly call infection control. There's no infection control. There's lots of infections, but no control. But you can see <laughs> that there is no space, OK? That's the environment that I practice in. This is what we do. We do sick people. That's what we're supposed to do. But we get lots of other people, too, who are not so sick but they want our care, and that's how it works. So why do we get deception in emergencies? And I use the term emergencies not just to cope with my department, but with emergency care in general. So acute medicine, acute surgery, radiology, pre hospital care, the whole kit and caboodle. I think most of the reasons are situational. We, we heard some excellent talks this morning about the requirement, and I totally agree, to explain to patients fully what they need to know. I defy anyone to do it in my environment. We heard about the need for privacy and confidentiality. Try doing confidentiality in that. You know, let's get real about what we're trying to do. There are unrealistic demands and unrealistic expectations which need to be managed. And I would argue deception, benevolent or otherwise, is a core part of demand management. Whether that comes from us as clinicians or from our masters in our healthcare systems. But we cannot give the level of care that we'd like to give and we somehow have to justify it. My little emergency department is not the busiest. If you want the busiest, go to Toon Moon and take a deep breath because it's even worse than us. Um, we see about 400 patients a day, but we're a stroke centre, a trauma centre, we're a tertiary oncology centre, and we're a big teaching place. We look after an increasing number of students every year. My doctors see between 30 and 40 patients every shift, which when you crunch the maths comes down to 10 to 12 minutes per patient. That's assuming you do all the peeing and the eating you're going to do in your one hour of break. If you can't do that, you'll probably be even more pushed for time. And remember, those 12 minutes include resuscitation cases, just as they also include people with the common cold. 
So you can spend three minutes with a patient with a common cold, but you then spend an hour with someone with a resuscitation, a trauma case, for example, a stroke case, your numbers are gone. And the complexity of our care gets worse and worse every day, as most people in this room know, because our population gets older and older. And we heard this morning, absolutely rightly, that they are the very patients who need time in the interests of disclosure to make sensible decisions on their health care. There has to be corporate responsibility for what we do as individual clinicians. And the two do not match, not just in Hong Kong, but across many developed countries. The expectations are incredibly high. You know, everyone thinks they should be seen now, but no one pays more than 15% tax. 70% of Hong Kong citizens pay no tax. Zero, nada, zilch, none. No, uh, none. So, we need to get real. We have massive reserves, and we then start deceiving ourselves as well as our colleagues. Rather than choosing a Hong Kong example, I've brought you a Scottish example. There is an Aberdeen in Scotland as well, which funnily enough is what the Aberdeen in Hong Kong was named after, Lord Aberdeen. We're back to more lords. But this was from about a year ago in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. I know that my colleagues there will not kill me for showing this, but accident emergency consultants are worried that doctors will not be able to provide the safe care of patients because of staff shortages. The number of senior a &E doctors could have dropped from 10 to 2 by August. You know, that, that is terrible. You know, of course it's terrible. But that wasn't the consultants. That was the registrars, because they're senior doctors. But the really senior doctors are the consultants, and there were still 10 of them. But what they were worried about was they might have to work at night time. <laughs> so they got this information out to a friend at the BBC who said, oh my goodness, you're not going to be able to staff the place. No, no, we won't be able to staff the place. Now, the reality is these consultants would still be at home. They might be on call, but they won't be in working. Is that the truth? Yes. Did they tell the truth? No. Did they tell an untruth? Not really, but a little bit. Did it get national and international attention on the news? You're damn right it did. Did they get resources on the back of this? Mm-hmm. Good luck to them. Did they deceive everyone? You're damn right they did. <laughs> How do we make this right? I think, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of problems today. We've heard of a lot of challenges and we've heard some solutions as to how we improve this situation. I think we really need to do a few things. The first thing I think is we have to have a true no blame culture. We talk about this all the time. We talk about, well, you know, no one gets blamed. I have yet to see a root cause analysis for any event in the hospital authority in Hong Kong that doesn't come back to an individual's failing. And that is wrong. That individual's usually been working for 40 hours and hasn't had time to even pee. It's not about individuals, it's about systems. And we need to stop blaming individuals unless clearly there is a major individual error and we'd all accept that, but more often than not, the root cause is not the person, it's the system that they work in. We need an honest debate about what we can provide, and until we sort that out, which clearly is not something I can do, we're gonna have people gaming the system, and that gaming will happen at all levels throughout, because it's what we do, and for gaming, substitute the word deceiving. Oh. Someone's trying to tell me something. Honesty and openness in records needs to be encouraged. I think most of us do record fairly straight what's happened. We need to also audit our practice, again, in a no-blame culture. We're very good at research in Hong Kong. We're not so good at audit. And by auditing our practice and finding our clinical issues, we can improve them, and that will reduce the issue of deception for everyone. My medical students often say to me, 
You're the only doctor we know who says, I don't know. I get asked lots of questions by the students, which is great fun. And, you know, nine times out of ten, I can give them something, but one time out of ten, I say, I don't know. I know nothing about acute X, Y, or Z. Go and look up the book. Come back and tell me once you find out, because I really don't know. That honesty is something that is clear from my students they do not see very often. As seniors, we should not be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing beings. We should be humans. And we should be saying, in all honesty, I'm not going to deceive you and say I know everything. I'm going to be truthful to you and say I don't. More of that could go an awful long way. And I would argue that the truth is always better than deception, but deception will be here for some time to come. That's my summary, and I'll stop and take some questions. Thank you.